Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm Kristen Motti, an adult programs librarian at the Boston Public Library Central Library. Tonight, guest author Ted Reinstein joins us for our first Arthur, Arthur program of the new year. So thank you for joining us for this special evening. We'll meet Ted in just a moment, but first a little bit about tonight's program. Ted is going to speak for about an hour and then following that, we'll have time for your questions. Thank you to those of you who submitted questions and comments in advance. We are in webinar space, so your microphones and your um, cameras are muted. Please share your questions if they, as they come up during the talk at any time through the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. The comments button will be closed for comments, but we will be sharing information out to you that way. So you can communicate with us through the Q&A button for tonight's program. And if you would like subtitles, either turn them on or turn them off, the CC Live Transcript button on the corner of your screen is the way that you can do that. Our bookstore partner for tonight's talk is Trident Booksellers. And you can please see the information on the screen or we'll share that information in the chat. You can purchase your copy of tonight's book through Trident and they will ship nationwide with free media mail shipping using the coupon code BPL ship. Now a little bit about tonight's featured speaker. Ted Reinstein has been a reporter for Chronicle, WCDB TV Boston's award-winning and America's longest running locally produced nightly news magazine since 1997. In addition, he has been a contributor for the station's political roundtable show and sits on WCBB's editorial board. Ted also has hosted programs for the Discovery Channel, HGTV, and the Travel Channel. His new book, Before Brooklyn, The Unsung Heroes Who Helped Break Baseball's Color Barrier, is his latest. Ted is also the author of New England Notebook, One Reporter, Six States, Uncommon Stories. He's also the author of Wicked Pissed, New England's Most Famous Feuds, and co-author with his wife, Anne Marie, of New England's General Stores, Exploring an American Classic. Ted, Ted joins us today from just outside of Boston, where he lives with his family. Ted, welcome. Thank you very, very much, Kristen, and thank you all for uh, coming out and joining me tonight, joining us. Uh, this is my fourth talk for the Boston Public Library, and I know I speak for all of, all of us when I say that I dearly wish that we'd been able to be in person at beautiful Rab Hall at the BPL. Um, on the other hand, this is pretty much the first time today I've been able to take my mask off, so let's look at the bright side, right? So with that, I'm going to jump in, uh, start the talk. Uh, two or three times during the talk, I will be reading from my book, a selection that's in support of that section of the talk, but I'm pretty sure you're all going to be able to follow along just fine. So with that, we'll jump back quite a few decades and jump in. As he turned right off Boston's busy Commonwealth Avenue and proceeded to shuffle down Babcock Street, not a single passerby would have guessed where the short, slightly stooped pedestrian with an armload of papers was headed. After all, it was 1938, and what possible business would a black man have with the white, wealthy co-owner of a Major League Baseball team? But the bespectacled young man was, in fact, headed to Braves Field, where he was to meet with co-owner of the Boston Braves, Bob Quinn. It's hard to imagine a meeting of more striking contrasts. The two participants themselves were as different as night and day. Their backgrounds of entirely other worlds. One man's father had been an immigrant stonecutter from Ireland. The other man's father had been born into slavery. Having never met, they shared little more than the air they breathed, but there was baseball and grievances and on this day, a rare and extraordinary opportunity. And Mabry Counts was determined to take advantage of it. You know, there's a reason why I start the book and end the book with Mabry Doc Counts. Doc, as he was better known, uh, he grew up pretty close to all of us, I'm sure, in most of uh, where you are tonight. He grew up in West Medford, Massachusetts. He was an extraordinarily gifted writer. Uh, he loved sports. He was not physically himself an athlete. He had been rather sickly and frail as a child. His three older brothers were extraordinary athletes in their own right. 
but he was a gifted writer. And the reason why I begin and end the book with Doc Counts is that he's always struck me in some ways as the prototypical quintessential unsung hero in this story. Um, like most of these unsung heroes in the story, he was essentially anonymous, unknown. He was not a celebrity. He was not powerful. He was not famous. He was not wealthy. He had no real political standing. He had no real social standing. And yet he was committed to a cause that was much, much bigger than himself, which was bringing down baseball's color barrier. And it was only joining with others who in most cases were just like him, pretty much that same profile, that they were able to find this collective power. So in some ways, as I say, Doc Counts really does represent uh, most of the unsung heroes in this book. There's no verbatim transcript of the meeting between Counts and Bob Quinn on that day at Brace Field in 1938. From Counts' own writing years later, we get a pretty good sense though of what the meeting was, at least from Quinn's perspective, what the agenda was. Um, Counts was to talk about the fact that the Braves and Braves Field could be made available for black professional baseball teams and some Negro League teams to play when the Braves were out of town. This was not something that was new. It would have been new to Boston, but it was not something that was new at that time in baseball. By the 1930s, there were major league ballparks all over America, including Yankee Stadium, Municipal Stadium in Cleveland that were rented out by Negro League and professional black baseball teams for these teams to play on when the major league teams were on the road. So that's certainly what Quinn uh, was expecting. Um, Counts had other things on his mind. He had already succeeded in doing something that nobody else really had done yet, which was to create a meeting between himself and someone representing the cause for bringing down the color barrier and a major league baseball owner. So Counts had other things on his mind as he sat in the executive suite above Braves Field that day. Unlike Quinn, he didn't stand to make a dime on anything they were discussing. His real interest lay with a much wider question than the momentary narrow one of how many black baseball games could fit on the schedule of the Boston Braves or any other major league team for that matter. The long game was much bigger. It was about blacks playing at Braves Field when the Braves were home. It was about blacks playing on the Braves and every other major league baseball team. Counts, with his expansive sense of historical context, wanted to make sure that Bob Quinn understood that simply having Blacks play baseball at Braves Field when his Braves were on the road was in and of itself actually no big deal. It was already being done all over baseball. What he wanted to discuss was something that was not only less well known, but in many cases unknown to many people, even those who followed Major League Baseball, that even the bigger, more momentous goal of playing at Braves Field run the Braves had already happened some 50 years earlier. This was actually about reintegrating baseball. At some point in the conversation, Doc Counts put down his arm load of papers and turned to Bob Quinn and gently prodded the owner. Certainly, Mr. Quinn, he said, as a lifelong learned man of Major League Baseball, certainly you are familiar with Moses Fleetwood Walker. You know, a question that Doc Counts loved to put to people later on after Jackie Robinson had broken the color barrier was this one. After Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier, who was the second major league baseball player who was African-American? And it's a bit of a trick question, which is what Doc Counts loved to do with people because it was Jackie Robinson. The first, African-American Major League Baseball player was Moses Fleetwood Walker. Most people today have no idea who Moses Fleetwood Walker was. You know, the interesting thing is most people have no idea that when baseball began in its real infancy in the decade or so after the Civil War had ended, baseball was an outlier in the sense that it was somewhat integrated, not extensively. There were never more than one or two black players on a professional baseball team and in the major leagues, as we'll see, there were only a few, but it was an outlier. It really actually in its infancy. So in that decade or so after the civil war, in the decade that major league baseball was created, 
it actually looked a bit more like America. Players like Bud Fowler, who is probably the single most impassioned player in all of baseball, black or white, in that first decade or so that baseball really mushroomed and took off. Frank Grant, the first black player from Massachusetts, the Berkshires, and most famous of all, the Walker brothers. Weldy Walker, the younger brother of Moses Fleetwood Walker, who's sitting in that chair on the far left or right. I never know how that goes at home, right? It's, it, it switches, I think. But at any rate, Moses Fleetwood um, was an extraordinary ball player. He was, without any question, the first real starring black professional baseball player, and he transformed an entire position. Here he's pictured with his younger brother Weldy when they were teammates briefly on the Oberlin, Ohio baseball team in 1884. And he transformed the position of catcher. So this is the period when the phrase backstop to denote a catcher is first created. And at that time, it literally meant just that. You know, today we think of the backstop usually you know, sometimes you'll see a writer being cute and refer to the catcher as the backstop. But generally today, backstop refers to a physical structure on a baseball diamond, you know, where we keep the ball from, from rolling away. That's what a catcher was before Moses Fleetwood Walker. That's where a team would stick their least talented player who had one job, just keep the damn ball from rolling off the field and delaying the game. But Moses Fleetwood Walker transformed it. He was the first catcher to wear Shin guards, first catcher to wear a chest protector, first catcher to wear a protective mask, and the first catcher to throw a runner out attempting to steal a base because he was what we would call today a five-tool player. He could throw, he could hit, he could run, he could feel, he could hit with power. So he was an extraordinary player, and he was good enough that he was signed to a major league contract in 1884 with the Toledo Blue Stockings in Ohio which at that time was a major league baseball team. So look at the timing of this. 1884 is almost exactly 20 years from the Emancipation Proclamation, the end of the Civil War, the death of Abraham Lincoln. So when a black player, some almost exactly 20 years later, takes the field as the first black major league player in America, this was heralded by many people as a sign that reconstruction was fulfilling its promise that we were actually beginning in baseball as the national pastime, a phrase that comes into being at this time, is actually something of a national salve, a national bomb. It's actually re-knitting, rebinding a nation that had literally torn itself in two. Not everyone felt that way. Not everyone felt that way. And for our story, not everyone felt that way even in that very first game that Moses Fleetwood Walker debuted in as a major league player and no one felt less that way than this guy. Adrian Constantin, better known as Cap, he was the captain of the Chicago Cubs, Cap Anson. Cap Anson was undeniably the first bona fide superstar of Major League Baseball. In baseball's first decades, he was the superstar of Major League Baseball. The Cubs were the marquee baseball team, sort of the, 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 the New York Yankees of their era. He was a slugger. He hit for power. He was a slugging first baseman. Routinely hit 27, 28, 29 home runs a year. This is during what's called, you've, you've probably heard of the phrase, the dead ball era. Well, baseballs were not wound by machine at that time, wound by hand. They were not as tight. They did not travel as far. So to hit 29 home runs, many historians believe that would be the equivalent of hitting 69 or 79 home runs today. And extraordinarily, Cap Anson still to this day, holds several Chicago Cubs batting records. So that's all true. Equally true, Cap Anson was an unrepentant racist. He was a vicious bully, and he had a really foul mouth to match, none of which you'll find on his plaque in Cooperstown. But all equally true. And Cap Anson bitterly resented the Cubs taking the field against the team that that day uh, fielded a black ball player. He played the game under protest. He filed a protest with Major League Baseball, and he said that going forward, his Chicago Cubs would no longer take the field against any team that fielded a black player. He used a different word. So Major League owners had to regard this threat rather seriously because not only was Cap Anson the most famous player in all of baseball at that time, but the Chicago Cubs were not only 
in terms of their image as the, the most famous baseball team, they were also the most financially successful baseball team. So major league owners had to regard this threat rather seriously, and they did. And they met in the summer of 1887 in Buffalo, New York. And this is how well they regarded Cap Anson's threat. They acceded to it. They met, they formed a gentleman's agreement, which meant that there was no transparency about it. There was no vote that was recorded. There was no statement. There was no transcript of the meeting. Nobody came out after the meeting to uh, talk to the press, answer questions. And that's the case as we well know with gentleman's agreement. There's a reason why they call it a gentleman's agreement. Um, there's nothing gentlemanly about it other than the fact that it's almost always been entered into between men and it almost always has been about something, whether it has barred Jews, barred gays, barred women, you name it. It has been something that people have entered into an agreement to bar somebody generally um, and they know that it stinks and that's why there's no transparency about it. But with this meeting, the color barrier in Major League Baseball was created. And going forward, no blacks would be allowed to sign a major or minor league contract. Those who held existing contracts, like Fleetwood Walker, were allowed to honor their contracts through the duration of the contract. And then that was it. You know, I mentioned Bud Fowler a few moments ago as being probably the most impassioned early black ball player. There's, there, are, there are several stories that I found in researching this book and writing about them that I would call poignant. And there are a couple that I regard as heartbreaking. And Bud Fowler's is one of them. Um, Bud Fowler was someone who was seen as genuinely living to play baseball. He lived and breathed baseball. Um, there are stories of him getting off a train to sign on with a new team somewhere where he, you know, someone will say, Mr. Mr. Fowler, can we get your bags? And he had everything he needed uh, on his body. He carried a little satchel slung over his bat and it held his glove and a couple of baseballs and a pair of cleats. And that was it. He played baseball almost literally year round. He would travel literally the hemisphere according to the seasons playing baseball. And with the advent of the color barrier, he found more and more that he was no longer able to play professional baseball. And to me, there is something, as I say, particularly heartbreaking because this guy had no political agenda. His only agenda was that he loved playing baseball. He died of a blood disorder in Frankfurt, New York in 1913. He was only 55. His unmarked grave, which you see here, told not a word of a truly extraordinary life. For years since the color barrier began to spread in 1887, Fowler had relentlessly fought for a place in organized baseball. Along with all the other early black professional players, he had continued to try and play in the shadow of the descending barrier as teams shed black ball players and refused to sign more. Fowler had uncommon talent, there's no question, but often it seemed that his greatest skill was in seeming to somehow doggedly outrun the inescapable end as if he simply willed himself to persevere, to compete and play, and even excel in an increasingly hostile landscape that move about as he might, expelled him at shorter and shorter intervals. In Michigan in 1895, Bud Fowler was finally out of options. They all were, but Bud Fowler had outlasted virtually all of the others. He was the last black man standing. My skin is against me, Fowler wrote in Michigan in 1895. If I had not been quite so black, who knows? I might have been be able to catch on as a Spaniard or something of that kind. Who knows? The race prejudice is so strong, my black skin, it just bars me. Now, as the 20th century unfolded, it barred them all. The color barrier was complete. It would take another 50 years of fierce Fowler-like will and determination to break through again. So now we are out of the period of the early advent of the color barrier into the 1890s. And at this point, with the color barrier now in place in Major League Baseball, Major League Baseball was no longer an outlier, right? So we said that early on in its infancy, in its first decades or so, the Major Leagues, the 1870s, 
it was something of an outlier to some extent. To some extent, it was integrated. It is no longer. And now baseball is just like every other facet of American life, from education to housing to politics to you name it. Now, baseball is like every other part of American life. Jim Crow has moved in. And Jim Crow comes into being now as state-sanctioned segregation. This is the period of Plessy versus Ferguson, right? Celebrated case, which about 25 years ago in a poll of American jurists was voted the single worst Supreme Court decision in American history. It legally sanctioned segregation. This is the period of separate but equal, which was true, always half. It was always separate. It was never equal. And now from baseball to every other facet of American life, to what part of the room you wait for a bus or get a drink of water at, was segregated. But it doesn't mean that blacks weren't playing baseball. And it doesn't mean that they weren't playing at high levels. And it doesn't mean they weren't playing organized professional baseball. It just meant they weren't playing at the most elite level at which most Americans saw baseball, which was the major leagues. And it bothered. It bothered one person perhaps more than anyone else, Rube Foster. Andrew Rube Foster was a gifted, gifted African-American pitcher. He stood, he was physically imposing. He stood about 6'3", weighed about 245 pounds. Uh, it must have been horrifying to stand in against him with his fastball. And when he retired, he was determined to find a more elite level for fellow black ball players like himself, even though he was stepping out of the game, to be able to showcase their talents. And he was determined to create, literally, a league of their own. His feeling was, whites may prevent us from playing in the major leagues, they can't prevent us from creating our own most elite level of play. And he was determined to create the Negro Leagues, which he did. And his, he pitched it to all potential owners and investors that the Negro Leagues would be the ship. Everything else out there will be the sea. So where do you want to be? And the argument won the day. And the winter of 1920 in Kansas City, Missouri, the Negro Leagues were born. And Andrew Rube Foster is rightly seen today as the father of the Negro Leagues. You're looking at the first class of Negro League owners. Rube Foster sitting right in the middle there in the center. I want to draw your attention in that front row to Rube Foster's uh, left, again, or right, um, the only white owner in the history of the Negro Leagues. So this is 1920. The Negro Leagues will begin to peter out in the early 1960s. They'll be gone before the 1960s are over. But J.L. Wilkinson was one of the first-year class of Negro League owners. He was the owner of the Kansas City Monarchs, one of the two or three most storied, legendary Negro League teams in history, and one of the last uh, to, to, to survive. Um, the only white owner in the entire history of the Negro Leagues. And I don't bring that up as to point them out as some sort of ethnic peculiarity. I bring it up because there is a direct through line, direct line in the next 25 years, right between J.L. Wilkinson and Jackie Robinson, because J.L. Wilkinson will be the owner that will give Jackie Robinson his first contract in the Negro Leagues from which Robinson will jump directly to the major leagues. J.L. Wilkinson will also figure, as we'll see, in many other parts of the story over the next 25 years. But with the birth of the Negro Leagues, well, the way I always put it is, look, African-Americans knew that players who played on the level with extraordinary talent, like Pops Lloyd, Judy Johnson, they knew these guys existed. They saw them. They came to the ballparks and watched them play. It was whites who didn't know these players existed. This, the formation of the Negro Leagues, creates a showcase for players on this level. Players on the level, people like Oscar Charleston, one of the five or six greatest short subs to ever play. James Cool Papa Bell, arguably the fastest human being to have ever played baseball. It was whites that hadn't early on seen players of this caliber play. The reason why the Negro Leagues become the single most vital, significant unsung hero in the entire story is that they create the showcase. They create the platform that players of this caliber will be seen, not just by blacks, by whites. That is what, in the end, 
will begin to change the day. Cool Papa Bell, you know, really one of the most fascinating Negro leaguers in, in all of history. Um, it's, it's wonderful when you read about some of the anecdotes of people trying to get a sense of just how fast uh, Cool Papa Bell was. Uh, he was known as the human blur. Uh, people would look down into their, their scorebooks to quickly, you know, jot a, a, a line in their scorebook to indicate that he had, for instance, walked to, for, you know, gotten a walk. And in that moment that they're literally jotting a diagonal line, uh, they would look up and look for where he was. And he would be like on second base, or maybe he'd be on third base. Uh, greatest quote of all about how fast Cool Papa Bell comes from his longtime friend and teammate, um, Satchel Page. Now, I must say up front that Satchel Page was known to exaggerate uh, over the course of his life, sometimes in small ways, sometimes in big ways. But um, he was once asked just how fast his friend Cool Papa Bell was on the baseball field. And Page said, never mind the ball field. He said, fastest move I ever saw Cool Papa make was in a hotel room. It's okay. He said, I think we were in St. Louis. I was already in bed. And he said, Cool Papa was fixing to get into bed. And I said, Cool Papa, before you get into bed, can you hit the lights? And he said, you know, Cool Papa hit the lights and the room was dark before he was back under the covers. So again, that's Satchel Page. So the Negro Leagues replicate the mushrooming success of the major leagues in their first decade. So that decade of the 1920s, the Negro Leagues take off. They go from 11 teams to 14 teams to 19 teams to enough teams to separate into a Negro American League, a Negro National League, just like the majors, the first two Negro League World Series. And it looks like the Negro Leagues will continue to mushroom and explode with popularity all over the country. But then most of America in the 1920s was also experiencing explosive growth until it came to an explosive halt. So we know that by the end of the 1920s, we reached the Great Depression in 1929 and 1930. I think sometimes we forget just how cataclysmic the Great Depression was. Maybe some of you had relatives or parents, grandparents that, that grew up during the Depression. I know I remember hearing stories from my late dad who was 10 or 11 years old in the worst years of the Depression, 30, 31, 32, 33. But I think we forget just how bad it, that it was I mean, in those worst years, the beginning years of the Depression, often over a quarter of the country was unemployed. And that number actually got flipped in minority communities. In many minority communities, it flipped the other way, where only a quarter was working and three quarters were unemployed. There was a good reason for that, because the golden age of the Negro Leagues in the 1920s was also the period, even back before that several decades, of the Great Migration which was the period of the greatest movement of African-Americans from the American South to cities in the North, where they were going seeking better jobs, better lives for themselves, their children, better working conditions, better quality of life. And the good news is they found that. They found that in cities clear across the central United and Northern United States from Denver to Cleveland to Baltimore, Pittsburgh, Atlanta, they found it, they found that. The bad news was that when the depression hit, they were very often among those who were newest at work and jobs that they had found so that that old you know saying applied last hired first fired so in places like Pittsburgh Philadelphia Atlanta you had over 75 percent minority unemployment 30,000 or more businesses going under every single year in those first uh, years of the depression including the Negro Leagues up in smoke gone I mean look if you are trying to cobble together a few bucks to be able to pay rent, be able to, you know, put some food in front of your children. Uh, you are not outlaying money to buy baseball tickets. So the Negro Leagues were gone. Now, the major leagues were also uh, thriving businesses. So you might wonder how many major league teams were forced to fold. Not so many. Uh, the difference being that while the Negro Leagues depended entirely on ticket revenue and nobody was buying ballgame tickets, um, they did often have slender lines of credit from, the, from, from black owned banks, but those banks folded. The, the major league teams at that time, 16 major league teams, virtually every single one. Today, you know, there are sometimes business consortiums that own certain major league teams in all four major league sports. Not the case then. The 16 major league teams in the 1930s, virtually every single one was owned by a wealthy white man. Every single one, including our own Boston Red Sox, Tom Yawkey. I don't know if you remember what 
you got on your 16th birthday, but Tom Yawkey came into $16.34 million. And five years later, he came into about $32 million more and he bought the Boston Red Sox. The irony is that Tom Yawkey was actually a relative pauper in comparison with some of his other uh, major league owners. Uh, I mentioned the Chicago Cubs earlier. Chicago Cubs at that time were owned by a guy named Phil Wrigley. Phil Wrigley had a little thing going with chewing gum. St. Louis Cardinals were owned by a guy named Augustus Bush. Gussie Bush brewed a little beer. So they were all insulated from the worst effects of the Great Depression. The Negro Leagues were not. But one Negro League team managed to survive into the worst years of the Great Depression. And we meet up once again with J.L. Wilkinson, the owner of the Kansas City Monarchs. So J.L. Wilkinson was determined that he was not going to lay off his team. He was going to keep his team employed, he said, by hook or by crook. And he tried to do just that. And here he is barnstorming through Canada in one of the worst years of the Depression, 1934. And uh, they, they literally, he said, the only way we're going to be able to do this is by playing 365 days a year. And they pretty much did. And again, just like Bud Fowler did in his old days, they literally circumnavigated the hemisphere, playing in the winter in the South and into the Caribbean and Havana and Cuba. And then they would come back up on the West Coast and go through Canada, which is where they are here. And in this way, you know, I thought of JL in October when Aaron Feuerstein died. Now, you may recall Aaron Feuerstein was the owner of the Malden Mills, makers of Polar Tech in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And in 1992, when the Malden Mills burnt to the ground, Aaron Feuerstein made headlines really world over by refusing to lay off his workers. Even though there was no job for them to go to, um, he kept them all on payroll and he paid everybody until the mills reopened. I thought of Aaron Feuerstein um, with Jay, when he died and I thought of J.L. Wilkinson, uh, very similar. There's no way they could have kept doing this forever. Uh, he would have ultimately had to stop. There was just no way to keep cobbling together enough barnstorming games to do this. And without Pittsburgh, that would have come to an end. The Negro Leagues had already come to an end. But because of Pittsburgh, which is the only unsung hero in the book, which is a city, the Negro Leagues are reborn. They are reborn in Pittsburgh. And I, I say in the book that without Pittsburgh, you wouldn't have Brooklyn. You might have had Brooklyn later on. Brooklyn might have been the city where the color barrier was broken. It might have happened later. I think without Pittsburgh, it would have happened as later as the 50s and 60s. My own guess, it would have happened during the 1960s without Pitt, with what, what happened in Pittsburgh. Because Pittsburgh allowed that platform, that showcase of the most elite black ball players, the Negro Leagues, to be reborn. Without that, you do not have the color barrier falling only 20 years, less than that, only about 15 years later. And the Negro Leagues are reborn in Pittsburgh because of two extraordinary men. I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we started talking about uh, Doc Counts and Bob Quinn, co-owner of the Boston Braves, as a study in striking contrasts. In some ways, this is a, a study in even more striking contrasts. Uh, Cumberland Posey Jr. and Gus Greenlee, you know, they may look like they share some things in common, right? They're both African-American men. They're both from Pittsburgh. Um, they both like sports. That's it. These two men loathed each other their entire lives. They were mortal enemies, arch enemies, lifelong foes. Um, how much did they hate each other? The only thing they ever agreed on, but it was important, the only thing these two guys ever agreed on was that it would be a good thing to bring the Negro Leagues back into existence. And on that, they cooperated. Strangely enough, and they cooperated well. They didn't actually deal with each other, but they cooperated. And just for that, uh, we have to be thankful. But Cumberland Posey, uh, actually extraordinary story in his own line. His, his dad as well. His dad was really a celebrated civil engineer, an incredible black success story for his time. Uh, in the 18, late 1800s in, uh, in Pittsburgh, he uh, became very wealthy, owned three or four successful businesses, built a big house for his family in the Hill District, the black section of Pittsburgh at that time. And I'm sure he had hoped that his young son, Cum Posey Jr., would have followed him into the family business. But Cum Posey Jr. was a sports nut. He lived and breathed sports, uh, basketball and baseball. Um, Here's, I'll give you an answer to, the, to one of the best trivia questions of all, and now you'll know this, and uh, you don't even have to thank me. Um, the only person who is in both the basketball and the baseball halls of fame, Cumberland Posey Jr. 
You're welcome. But baseball won out. And in late 1920s, a um, group of people come up to him in Pittsburgh and they say, you know, this wonderful team, the Homestead Grays, which has a great history in Pittsburgh, um, but it had fallen on hard times. And it was about to completely go under uh, unless somebody was willing to buy it and resuscitate it. And Cumberland Posey agreed to do it. So he took over the Homestead Grays. Homestead, a section of Pittsburgh just outside the city limits, even closer than Worcester is to Boston. He took over the Homestead Grays. He turned out to be not only a great baseball strategist, great baseball tactician, but he was incredibly inspiring to young ball players. He was a terrific coach. He was a great promoter. And his Homestead Grays, uh, it's safe to say he not only resuscitated the Homestead Grays, in 1931, the Homestead Grays had, I think, and many baseball historians think, the greatest season that any baseball team, black or white, any baseball team has ever had. They won 143 games. Let me put that in context. So today, Major League Baseball teams play 162 games. In 1931, Major League Baseball played 154 games. So the Homestead Grays won 143. Um, it was an incredible, an incredible success story. Um, but not to be outdone, Cumberland Posey's nemesis, Gus Greenlee, was determined to try to outdo it. So Gus Greenlee, completely different life story. Uh, his dad brought his family from Mobile, Alabama, up to, uh, I'm sorry, Memphis, Tennessee, up to uh, Pittsburgh uh, for a better life. And they found that. Uh, but then, of course, the Depression hit. Uh, before that, Gus Greenlee uh, drafted into the Army, goes overseas, fights in World War I. He's wounded at the Battle of Verdun. He's decorated. He comes back to Pittsburgh, and uh, he needs a job. This is the depths of both the uh, uh, Prohibition, era Prohibition, and the Great Depression. Needs a job. He uh, cobbles together enough money to buy a rickety old car and figures, I'll drive a cab. Gets approached one day by a guy who says, hey, look, pal, I'm looking for somebody to run some bootleg hooch around town, bootleg liquor to a few speakeasies. And uh, how would you like a job? And Gus Greenlee says, well, I have a job. This is my job. This is my car. The guy says, uh, how much money do you make in your best day? And Gus Greenlee said, I don't know. I mean, maybe on my best day, I've made, I don't know, eight or nine bucks. And the guy says, okay, why don't you multiply that by 50? And how would you like a job? And Gus Greenlee said, when do I start? And he never worked um, another honest day in his life. Um, he went from running numbers and running bootleg liquor to gambling and you name it, Gus Greenlee was in it, but it wasn't legal. Um, however, he was a complicated guy and he really was seen very much as kind of a Robin Hood figure in the Hill District, the black section of Pittsburgh in the 1930s. Um, it was routine that if someone had fallen upon hard times, needed some money to cover a doctor's bill for the kids or what have you, an envelope would almost magically appear under their front door and there would be money from Gus Greenlee. Every single Christmas, people knew to open up their door and there would be a big basket with a big ham dinner courtesy of Gus Greenlee. So he was beloved in the Hill District. Um, and he also was approached about um, taking over uh, another soon to be defunct baseball team in Pittsburgh. At this point, Gus Greenlee had also just opened um, a jazz club, the Crawford Grill, which in itself became something of a, it was seen as a melting pot. It was welcoming to all blacks, whites, you name it. It became a jazz mecca. You name the jazz uh, artist of that period, Basie, Billie Holiday, Fitzgerald, uh, Louis Armstrong, you name it, they all played the Crawford Grill. So Gus Greenlee uh, said, yeah, I'll take that team over and I'm gonna rename them the Crawfords so that I can promote the Crawford Grill. And he did. So he, in 1932, didn't quite win 143 ball games like his nemesis Cumberland Posey, but he did win almost 100 games against just 32 losses. And he did it largely by poaching his rival's best players. So he poached a promising young pitcher by the name of Satchel Paige, who's right in the center, tall guy in the back there in the center. And he also poached, for good measure, Satchel Paige's battery mate, catcher, Josh Gibson, who was a very promising catcher and very, even more promising hitter. 
it's hard to overstate what Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson meant to breaking the color barrier. Um, they are the two people in the entire story who are not technically speaking unsung heroes because they're very much sung. Uh, Satchel Paige, one of the most legendary baseball players in all of history. And he did make it to the major leagues. So he was not unsung and unknown in that sense, but he and Josh Gibson are crucial to the storyline changing now about breaking the color barrier. You know, whites were beginning to see players like Oscar Charleston and Judy Johnson and, and Cool Papa Bell play baseball at a high level. With Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson, they were now seeing black players that were not just playing at a high level, they were seeing black players who they suddenly desperately wanted to see play on their major league team. If you saw Satchel Paige pitch against the New York Yankees at Yankee Stadium in the 1930s, as he did, and strike out Joe DiMaggio three times, as he did, only time in DiMaggio's entire career, he struck out three times, you find yourself saying, not only can this guy play, but why can't this guy play on the Yankees? And then you were reminded, oh yeah, he can't play on the Yankees because of the color barrier. This is the effect that Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson had on the effort to break the color barrier. How good a play was Josh Gibson? Somewhat less famous, always played in the shadow of Satchel Paige, universally known even while he was playing as the Black Babe Ruth. You know, funny story, late in his life, he met the real life Babe Ruth. And Babe Ruth put his big meaty arm around Josh Gibson as he was wont to do. And he said, Mr. Gibson, what an honor. I understand they call you the Black Babe Ruth. How about that? And Josh Gibson said to Babe Ruth, with all due respect, sir, my people call you the white Josh Gibson. So all a question of perspective. So question, how do we know so much about the Negro Leagues. We've just been talking about all these players and what they did and these teams and what their records were and how extraordinary it was. How do we know that? Their entire libraries full like the BPL where you can find scores of books about the Negro Leagues. How? And they're filled with data. They're filled with records, filled with statistics. Where? Where did that come from? The white mainstream press at no time in the entire history of the Negro Leagues ever dedicated one single sports writer as a beat reporter to a Negro League team or the entire Negro Leagues for that matter, one reporter, never happened. So how, 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 how is all this information being processed if the white press wasn't reporting on the Negro Leagues? The black press. The black press, I would say, second only to the Negro Leagues themselves, the most important unsung hero in the entire story because without the black press, and by the way, the period of the 1930s, which is really the golden age of the Negro Leagues, also the golden age of the black press in America. So central, so central, not just to raising the consciousness and raising the focus of players like Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson and, 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 and how criminal it was that they weren't able to play Major League Baseball because they were the, 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 the equal or the better of most major league ball players, but they also were beginning to raise the consciousness all over the country of the fact that the color barrier existed, which people routinely were able to forget about, especially in white communities. Play, pioneering publishers like Robert Lee Van, Pittsburgh Courier, greatest distribution of any black newspaper in American history. And just slightly second, Robert Sengstag Abbott, creator of the Chicago Defender, the second greatest, Black newspaper in terms of distribution in American history. And these guys put found writers like Wendell Smith and Sam Lacey, who began not just writing about the Negro Leagues, not just writing about players like Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson, but writing about them as three-dimensional people. That's what no one have ever done before. That specifically was what white readers had never read before, that these guys had an entire life story. Not only were they the best pitcher that white fan may have seen at Yankee Stadium, but this guy had an entire story behind him that was also fascinating. And it made them three-dimensional people. But you know, we're talking about pioneers and unsung heroes who paved the way for someone like Jackie Robinson. It's important to remember who paved the way if we're talking about the golden age of the black press 
for gifted writers like Wendell Smith and Sam Lacey, because that is the most fearless journalist I think I have ever, ever read about. And that's Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells, tragic story growing up, grew up in Alabama, oldest of six siblings, both of parents die in a cholera epidemic. She becomes the, the single, the sole breadwinner and provider of her younger siblings. She becomes fascinated with journalism, goes to college, begins, starts her own newspaper, puts everything she has into affording a printing press, shipped from Chicago, sets up her printing press in, in, in Memphis, Tennessee. It's what she began writing about, focusing about that got her into trouble. She was determined that she was going to introduce the rest of America. She knew that blacks in the American South knew about lynching because more often than not, they were forced to see it. They knew someone who might have been a victim of it. But she was determined to introduce lynching to the rest of America. And she did relentlessly, fearlessly, to the point that she was literally driven out of the South. Her newspaper office was firebombed, printing press destroyed, and she flees to Chicago. But she never stops writing about the scourge of lynching. And in 2020, in 2020, she finally got some of the credit that she so richly deserves when she won a posthumous Pulitzer Prize for investigative journalism. So she really paved the way for people like Wendell Smith and Sam Lacey, pictured here with Dan Bankhead, who was one of the greatest Negro League pitchers. They were on their way in this photograph to Dodgers training camp in the early 1940s. But their way was paved by Ida B. Wells. The kind of inspiration they got from her was what led them to do the kind of writing they did. So I mentioned that you were able to read the stories of people like Wendell Smith and Sam Lacey all over America. The consciousness was being raised about the reality of the color barrier all over America. You could pick up the Pittsburgh Courier, not everywhere, but you could pick up the Pittsburgh Courier and read a story by Wendell Smith in Spokane, Washington, Miami, Florida, Fort Worth, Texas, Phoenix, Boston, New York, Elmira, Chicago. How? How? These were newspapers, the Courier, the Defender, the African American in Baltimore. These were newspapers that could barely meet deadline daily. It was all they could do to get their bundles of newspapers out to the whatever dozen or so newsstands around the city that covered the paper, sold their papers every night. How are they getting their newspapers out to all these cities all over America? How introduces the single most improbable ally in the entire story, the most improbable unsung hero in this entire saga, the Pullman Porters. Pullman Porters were the face of overnight train travel in the golden age. We're talking about golden age of, of other things, golden age of train travel, the 1920s, 30s and 40s. And the Pullman Porters were the face, a public face to the public of overnight train travel, right? The Pullman Porters. So I'm sure many of them love baseball, but how was it that they get to be part of the story of breaking the color barrier? Well, they became a delivery system for black newspapers all over the country. You know, these, uh, these, these pioneering publishers like Robert Lee Vannon, Robert Sengstag Abbott, <laughs> these were incredibly creative, incredibly brilliant guys who always were looking for ways to cut corners, cut costs, but also ways of increasing the distribution, however they could. And in the Pullman Porters, they saw a unique opportunity. The Pullman Porters traveled all over America. They were revered in the black community and they really in many ways were the beginning of the black middle class in America. And they traveled all over the country. And so these publishers saw the opportunity here, if they could get them on board, literally, to help deliver the newspaper. And they did. How did it work? Well, let's say that a train is leaving South Station in Boston. Well, the Pullman Porters were also part of provisioning the trains, right? So let's say they're responsible for getting the bread on board a train that's leaving South Station for a run, let's say, down the eastern seaboard. So a bread truck would come from often a Black-owned bakery in, let's say, Forest Hills, Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan, you name it. The bread truck arrives at South Station. So it's got these big, usually five foot high wicker baskets full of bread. Bottom of the baskets, there are bundles of newspapers. 
In Boston, that could be the Boston Reporter, the Boston Chronicle, the Guardian. The newspapers are unloaded with the bread. Train pulls out, makes its first stop in, let's say, Penn Station, New York. The Boston papers are offloaded surreptitiously. Anytime these guys would have been caught doing this, they never were. But if any of them had been caught distributing these papers, it would have been fired on the spot. But they offload the Boston papers in New York. They onload, let's say, the Amsterdam News. They get to Baltimore. They offload the Amsterdam News. They onload the Afro American in Baltimore. And this goes on all the way down through Washington, Chattanooga, Miami. And this is happening on trains fanning out in every direction all over the country. So you can get to a point in 1939, for instance, when you have this great anecdote of a New York Times executive who's on vacation in San Francisco, can't find the New York Times, but to his disbelief, finds a copy of Pittsburgh's Courier. So the Pullman porters were responsible for that. And by now we're up to 1940. So we're only five years away now from the color barrier falling. Now, you wonder how's that going to happen in just five years? Because by 1940, Major League Baseball, this wasn't even on a, an agenda item. It wasn't being discussed, dropping the color barrier. But in 1940, you have another pivotal event, just like the 1920s into the 1930s, the Great Depression. 1940, America is preparing to go to war, right? And in New York, you have another incredibly unlikely unsung hero, um, Lester Rodney. Lester Rodney um, would fit no one's profile of a likely ally in the bid to break the color barrier. Um, he was in New York. He was white. He was Jewish. He was a communist. Hey, nobody's perfect. But he also loved baseball, loved baseball, loved to write about baseball, hated the color barrier, determined to do something about it. But what would that be? Well, he was desperate to find a job where he could be paid to write about baseball. He would have taken a job with anybody. But in the late 1930s, the American Communist Party and its daily, its, its daily newspaper, The Daily Worker, started a sports section for the first time and they needed a sports editor. Lester Rodney took the job. Um, and he began writing about the color barrier in all of his stories about baseball. And he phrased the argument for why the color barrier was unjust and should and must be broken in a new way, in a way that had never been articulated before because it took into account that America was going to war. And Lester Rodney, almost daily, would remind people that America is going to war, that blacks as well as whites are being drafted. Blacks as well as whites are training right now to go off to fight. Blacks as well as whites will be fighting. Blacks as well as whites will die. Blacks as well as whites will come back to America in boxes. And those who come back who are black and who have survived and who play baseball will have just been asked to have die for their country if necessary, but not be able to sit where they want on a bus or play major league baseball. And this began to resonate in a new way. And in that sense, you know, it's often struck me as there are other social justice arguments that reach a pivot point where suddenly it just changes. It just finally changes. It happened with marriage equality. It happened with, with drunk driving. And it happened in 1940. It began to happen with the question of breaking the color barrier. And a year later, of course, America is at war. You know, I mentioned the Pittsburgh Courier. It was, it was a difficult thing. You know, you read poignant stories at the, in the period of African-Americans who were going off to fight and who struggled, who struggled with the notion of going off to fight and possibly die for their country where they will return if they survive still as second-class citizens. And the Pittsburgh Courier inaugurated a campaign called the Double V Campaign, Double V for Double Victory. And the whole idea was go off to fight, fight for your country, defeat Adolf Hitler, come home, defeat Jim Crow. That's a handkerchief that was worn by members of the Tuskegee Airmen, the most celebrated all black unit in World War II. But there was another celebrated all black unit that is far less known than the Tuskegee Airmen and that figures much more prominently 
into this story, and that is the 761st Tank Battalion. The 761st was the first all-black armored unit in history, fought with Patton's Third Army, set records for consecutive days at the front, one of the first units to cross into Germany, one of the first units to liberate a death camp. And for our purposes and this story, because of its lieutenant, a young lieutenant who was one of its officers, name of Jack Roosevelt Robinson. Jackie Robinson earned his lieutenant stripes at Fort Riley in Kansas, was transferred to Fort Hood in Texas to help take control and command of the 761st Tank Battalion. And Jackie Robinson could not wait, could not wait to lead the 761st into combat in Europe. And he almost made it, but he didn't. The 761st made it, but Jackie Robinson didn't go with them. Um, almost literally the night before, they were set to disembark for Fort Dix in New Jersey and then final disembarkation to Europe. Jackie Robinson flunked his last physical. An old football injury was discovered. He had been an All-American at UCLA, and an unhealed football injury was discovered. He was not cleared for combat and told he was going to have to stay behind. He pleaded with special permission to go off with the 761st as a special morale officer. It was denied. Jackie Robinson later called it the single biggest disappointment of his life. He realized he was going to have to just simply return to base. He decided uh, that night that he would return to, to, to Fort Hood and he would get himself a drink at the Black uh, Officers Club on Fort Hood. So he uh, got onto a bus, which constantly was making the rounds of Fort Hood, huge sprawling base, one of the biggest military bases in the world, still the largest in the United States. He took a seat directly behind the driver that night on that bus. Um, he did not intend or wish to cause trouble, um, although trouble found him. Um, he knew, in fact, that it shouldn't cause any trouble at all. Uh, Jackie Robinson knew that in taking a seat in the front row of the bus, that he was complete within his rights. He knew, and the bus driver very likely did not know, that 48 hours earlier, President Roosevelt had signed an executive order which prohibited segregation on military transports within domestic Amer American military bases. So Robinson knew he was within his rights. The driver did not. And as whites began to fill up the bus, he asked Robinson to move to the back of the bus. And Jackie Robinson said, I'm not moving. The bus driver a few minutes later stopped the bus at an MP sentry post. MPs came onto the bus. Jackie Robinson was handcuffed, removed from the bus. He was arrested. He was court-martialed and charged with disobedience and insubordination. Now, I'm going to guess that most of you had no idea that Jackie Robinson had once been court-martialed. Um, and if the court-martial had stuck, and Jackie Robinson had been summarily dismissed and dishonorably discharged from the American army, um, you would probably not know anything about Jackie Robinson at all today because Branch Rickey would have never signed Jackie Robinson. Uh, but Jackie Robinson beat the court-martial. That was the good news. The bad news is that he was without his unit and he was without a job uh, in 1944. So he needed a job and somebody suggested that he write a letter to the owner of the Kansas City Monarchs, which this person knew uh, was looking for some players to bolster his depleted lineup because many of his players were still overseas at that point. So Jackie Robinson wrote a letter to J.L. Wilkinson asking for a job and J.L. Wilkinson gave him one. So Jackie Robinson in 1945 spring traded his army uniform for the uniform of the Kansas City Monarchs. And here he is breaking camp with the Kansas City Monarchs in early April, 1945. I don't have to, have to ask, even though I can't see you, which I could if we were in person, but I don't have to ask for a show of hands to the question, how many of you know that in mere weeks from the time that this photograph was taken, Jackie Robinson would not be in Kansas City. Jackie Robinson would be in Boston, Massachusetts at Fenway Park. Uh, but he was, and he would be, because at the same time that this picture is being taken, so is this one. Izzy Muchnick, at the very same time that Jackie Robinson is breaking spring training with the Monarchs, is sitting in his law office in Boston, trying to figure out a way that he could force one of Boston's Major League Baseball teams to consider at least giving a tryout to a black ball player. Because Izzy Muchnick, just like Lester Rodney, loved baseball loved all sports, but he hated inequality and he hated the color barrier. Izzy Muchnick, in fact, was an incredibly moral person. Izzy Muchnick 
Only the second Jewish Boston City Council will become the first Jewish chairman of the Boston School Committee. Izzy Muchnick, brilliant young lawyer, went to Harvard, went to Harvard Law School. In fact, could have gotten a job with any number of what they used to call the Boston, the white shoe, you know, Boston law firms. Uh, but he wouldn't change his name. And Muchnick for many of those law firms was considered much too ethnic sounding. Um, Izzy Muchnick lived by something that in Judaism is called tikkun olam. Tikkun olam uh, translates literally as repair the world. And uh, Jews are called upon throughout their lives to repair the world however they can, whether it is uh, gender equality or civil rights or simply offering a kind word to someone who needs a kind word. That is also repairing somebody's world. But Izzy Muchnick had his eye on doing his tikkun olam by helping to integrate baseball. And he could not for the life of him figure out how he could find some leverage with some major league teams in Boston. And then one night he found it. He was looking through all these ordinances and city laws and bylaws and zoning laws, and he found one. You remember the old blue laws, very few of them still exist, if any, but one of them that existed in the 1930s was the one that Izzy Muchnick latched onto because it forbade Major League Baseball teams in Boston playing on Sunday without the unanimous consent of the Boston City Council in a vote that had to be taken annually. And suddenly Izzy Muchnick realized he had leverage. He was a Boston City Councilor. All he had to do was withhold his vote and he had real power and he used it. He wrote a letter to the brain trust of the Boston Red Sox. You see the tall guy standing there, the tie is uh, Eddie Collins himself, a former uh, uh, Hall of Famer, and at that time, the general manager of the Boston Red Sox. And Izzy Muchnick employed Eddie Collins to at least consider giving a tryout to some qualified Negro League baseball players. And Eddie Collins, who was sort of, you know, this kind of charming Southern guy, uh, didn't know who he was dealing with didn't know that Izzy Muchnick was a bulldog, was not gonna take no for an answer. And, uh, you know, he wrote back, he said, my esteemed Mr. Muchnick. He said, it may interest you to know that in my entire tenure with the Boston Red Sox, not a single black ball player has ever inquired about employment with the Boston Red Sox. So what is it I'm supposed to do? And uh, he said, uh, please find and close some tickets to the next Red Sox game. Anyway, Izzy Muchnick was a bulldog, would not take no for an answer. So he waited and he waited and he waited. He knew he was getting the runaround in about a week before the city council was to take up that year's vote to allow the Red Sox to play on Sunday. He wrote a cable to Eddie Collins. And he said, Mr. Collins, it appears you have no interest in taking seriously my request and therefore, this should serve to inform you, I will be withholding my vote to allow the Red Sox to play on Sunday in the upcoming 1945 season. Now, I don't know what the actual time duration was between Eddie Collins getting that and appearing in Tom Yawkey's office. My guess is it was under, well under five minutes. Uh, either way, that very same day, Izzy Muchnick got a return cable. There was no my esteemed Mr. Muchnick this time, but Eddie Collins did inform him that the Red Sox would hold a tryout for three, three black ball players. And please have them at Gate D at Fenway Park in the morning of April 12th, 1945. There can be no press whatsoever. Yours truly, Eddie Collins. So Izzy Muchnick had succeeded so far. He had a tryout now for three black ball players for the Boston Red Sox. He knew about Boston bylaws, did not know anything about the Negro Leagues. So he consulted with Wendell Smith of the Pittsburgh Courier. And Wendell Smith did, in fact, pick out three Negro League players, Marvin Williams, San Jethro, and a young kid at that time, just breaking camp with the Kansas City Monarchs, Jackie Robinson. And they came to Boston and they were all prepared to travel for the Red Sox on April 12th, when on April 12th, 1945, Franklin Roosevelt died and America closed down. So no trial. 24 hours later, America began to open up. 48 hours later, America is pretty much back to normal. But the Red Sox, curiously, are still racked with grief and still shut down. And they are trying to run out the clock, basically. And all they had to do was get two more days, just two more days, because on April 17th, on April 17th, 1945, the Red Sox are set to open their 1945 season against the Yankees at Yankee Stadium. On an April 16th, 
they will be catching a train at one o'clock in the afternoon out of Back Bay Station to take them to New York. And they almost made it. They almost made it. But in the morning of April 16th, 1945, the story broke. Dave Egan, a white sports writer for the Boston Traveler, broke the story. It was on page one. And he framed it as a letter to Boston sports fan. And basically, to paraphrase, Egan wrote, at this hour, you don't know this, but there are three Negro pro baseball players holed up where they've been marooned for a week in Boston. They have been promised a tryout by your Boston Red Sox, who are at this, at this moment prepared to skip town and renege on their promise. And the Red Sox realized they had to hold the tryout. So they called Izzy Muchnik. They said, get the players over here. And they did. They trooped over to Fenway Park. They were there and ready to start at 11 o'clock. They suited up. They took the field. They ran the bases. They took some infield. They took some batting practice. Less than an hour later, they were called off the field. They were thanked very much. They were told the Red Sox will be in touch. None of them ever heard from the Boston Red Sox ever again. But just south of Fenway Park, one person was paying rapt attention that morning to this tryout, Branch Rickey. Branch Rickey was horrified that morning that Tom Yawkey, who he detested, um, might go ahead and sign Jackie Robinson, who for a year at that point, Branch Rickey had already been planning to sign and break the color barrier. Now, in retrospect, of course, with hindsight, we know we could have assured Branch Rickey he had nothing to worry about because it was gonna to take Tom Yawkey another 12 years to break the color barrier. But Branch Rickey didn't know that. And so a mere six months later, here, as you see, in October, 1945, Branch Rickey will sign Jackie Robinson to a contract with the, Brook with the Brooklyn Dodgers top minor league team at the time, the Montreal Royals, and Jackie Robinson will break the color barrier at Ebbets Field in 1945. What was that day like? I end the book with my own sense of it. Wearing number 42, as he strode out to his position at first base that day at Ebbets Field, amid the din of cheering fans, of broadcasters announcing history, and of exploding flashbulbs capturing it, there were also two inaudible sounds at Ebbets that day of a cheering that could not be heard with the ear only with the heart. It rose from those not present physically, but spiritually. Those who could not be seen, but were there just the same. Moses Fleetwood Walker didn't live to see it. And by the time he died, broken, bitter, alcoholic, he couldn't even imagine it. But he was there. Bud Fowler tried his entire life to outrun the shadow of the descending wall that rose up to deny him at the end at every turn. In life, it seemed that he and his scuffed bat and well-worn mitt were everywhere, anywhere he could hook on to a baseball team, a black man desperately trying to just play baseball as long as he possibly could. Now, he was in Brooklyn. Ida B. Wells had reported, reported so tirelessly and compellingly on the scourge of racial violence that eyes began to finally open, if only in horror. She had despaired in life that she would ever see meaningful change. Now, she was in Brooklyn. Even as they worked their regular shifts that historic day, some rolling along the rails just within a mile of Ebbets Field on their way west or south, the Pullman Porters, who had ensured that those stories of Ida B. Wells and other Black journalists would reach readers all over America. They were there. The Negro leaders, past and present. Those who had come too early and those who were young enough to imagine that they too might now walk through the wall. They were there. And the African-American veterans, those who had just fought in the war that had just ended and those who had given their lives in it, they were there. On this momentous day, a ball game was played before a crowd both present and cheering and another crowd silent and unseen. They watched the game and they watched the terrible wrong being finally righted. To be sure, even as a black ball player bounded onto an otherwise all white field, racism was still alive and well in Brooklyn and clear on across America. Many other barriers remained in place. Many still are. But on this day, on this day, some of the hurt and the humiliation were salved. On this day, hope and faith that had long seemed to have run out were finally redeemed. On this day, 
The long arc of the moral universe seemed to bend improbably toward Brooklyn, touching down on the grass and the dirt of a creaky old ballpark where the familiar white lines would no longer bar a black ball player. And in the bottom of the seventh inning, when Jackie Robinson laid down a perfect bunt and raced toward first base, he was not alone. That invisible crowd was suddenly right there, running right alongside, willing him on. And as Robinson sprinted safely onto second base and caught his breath, they exhaled with him. After all, it had been a long, uncertain journey. And they had helped him get there. The next Dodger batter doubled. Jackie Robinson rounded third, and he was home. Thank you. Thank you very much. So at this point, I want to invite Kristen back out, and I would be happy to take any questions. Uh, if anybody has, uh, happy to take any. Kristen, welcome back. Thank, thank you, Ted. That was very informative and rich with history, and we do have a lot of, lot of questions for you. Good. I want to start with Sarah's question. You talked about this a little bit, but maybe you can elaborate. I, mean, I know you don't want to give the whole book away because you want people to read the book, but- I do. To what extent were white audiences reading black newspapers or attending Negro League games? And did white readership of the black press have an effect on the acceptance of black players in the majors later on? Great question. Great question on both counts. So first, the games. Early on, so in the Negro League's infancy, there were seldom many whites at Negro League baseball games, but that changed. It changed as word got out that the level of play was what it was. It also changed because as the level of play increased and these Negro League teams were seen as really good, good teams and great competition, white major league teams wanted to play them in barnstorming games. And it, it never, for the most part, happens today, but it was often the case. The, you know, people, even white teams, weren't making what they made anywhere near today. So it was not at all uncommon for white major league teams, if they had an off day, to play a Negro League team, often at that white team's major league ballpark. Those games that would routinely, whites would come out to watch, those were the games that seeded more whites coming to Negro League ballparks because they were seeing the level of play. As far as black newspapers, I don't think for the most part, now, I don't have numbers, but you know, my sense from what I've read it for the most part, it wasn't that readership of black newspapers was very great among white readers. It was more the fact that the celebrated sports writers of some of those papers, people like Wendell Smith and Sam Lacey, they actually began to be known. They actually had bylines that would be, for instance, Lester Rodney in New York, they would start, they would start to, 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 to use Wendell Smith's columns. Um, and so it began to develop the profile of some of those writers. Um, but I don't think that the readership of either of those papers, for the most part, um, Let's just say there were, there, were, there were many, many more whites who came to watch Negro Leaguers play than there were whites who were reading black newspapers. Thank you. Another question, we've gotten a couple of questions about what was your motivation for writing this book? And then perhaps you could also address what your research process was um, sure. with all of, those, all of the, the resources that you used. Sure, so in terms of, um, uh, why I wanted to write the book. Uh, Jackie Robinson has been a lifelong hero of mine. Um, I, I, I always remember that uh, when I was 12 years old, my dad gave me a framed picture of Jackie Robinson. Um, and he, I think, you know, really wanted to imbue me with a sense that this was a hero. Um, and I still have that photograph. And um, it was only later I mean, I loved baseball and I love the history of baseball. And I, I, you know, I've always uh, been interested in reading history of baseball, but it was only later, it was only in the last 20, 25 years that I would really begin to key into people who would be mentioned uh, in terms of the color barrier um, and often you know, would then just disappear. I mean, I might see a reference to them in a book I was reading, but when movies like 42 came out, they were never, they, they never seemed to be part of the conversation. Um, 
And so it just seemed that there was a group of people like Wendell Smith, like Sam Lacey, like Ida B. Wells, like the Pullman Porters, like Lester Rodney, who seemed to be crucially important to breaking the color barrier, but who just never seemed to get credit they deserve. Uh, and that's really was the genesis of, uh, of wanting, wanting to write about them. Uh, in terms of my research process, you know, a, a lot of it was, was reading. I mentioned, you know, I joked about the number of books and that, uh, but, but they were crucial. Um, the, uh, the Negro League Baseball Museum in Kansas City was, uh, was, was a really prime uh, resource for me. They were wonderful. Uh, I had endless conversations with them. Um, I mentioned Izzy Muchnick. I was very fortunate to uh, have been able to develop a relationship with his surviving son, who unfortunately we talked on the phone several times and unfortunately he passed away. Literally, uh, we had a date to meet in New York and uh, I wish that I had been able to meet him. But I did, was able to speak with sons of Pullman Porters. Um, and so these were, you know, some of the interviews that for me really enriched um, the research a lot. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think we have time for one more question. All right. Do Gordon asks, do any white major league ball players stand out as allies in making sure that the breaking of the color barrier was successful? And I'm sorry, good. Just so I'm clear, do, I think it was phrased in the present tense, but is the question, were there any um, white major league players at that time, at that time. who were allies? Mm -hmm. Yes. Good question. That's a great question. Um, you know, probably one of the one of the best allies, um, believe it or not, um, speaking of the Red Sox, uh, certainly wasn't Yawkey, but it was Ted Williams, believe it or not. Uh, Ted Williams had a terrible relationship with the press, but he had a great relationship with a number of black ball players. And uh, when Ted Williams was inducted uh, into the Hall of Fame, he said that the Hall of Fame must do more, must do more. And that was really a crucial uh, part of the Hall of Fame, which today has, has, has made leaps and bounds in terms of their celebrating the Negro Leagues and the role of, uh, not, not only the role of African-American baseball history, but also the, 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 you know, the insidiousness of the color barrier. Um, Ted Williams was, was, was a real ally. Um, he really was. Um, you know, there were not a lot of white players who stand out in terms of going to the mat, who really spoke out publicly, uh, but to the extent that he was quoted, he never, made speeches about it, but to the extent that he was quoted contemporaneously at that time in terms of how great these players were and how awful it was that they couldn't play in a major league teams. That was Ted, Ted Williams comes foremost to mind. Great, thank you so much. Sure. I think we are out of time at this point, but I do want to thank you for sharing the story with us. And oh, my hopefully pleasure. Hopefully people will now go out and, and get a copy of the book. Um, for those of you who are attending, the information is in the chat on where you can get a copy of the book from our partners at Trident and they will ship nationwide. I do wanna thank you all for joining us this evening. And just one, a few items before we wrap up for the evening. Um, you can order the book from our bookstore partners at Trident or check your local public library. For more information about resource services and programs from the Boston Public Library, programs like this and other programs for people of all ages, please visit us at bpl.org. An upcoming talk that we are having later this month that might be of interest will be with co-founder of Black Lives Matter, Patrice Coolers. She'll join us on the 31st to discuss her new book, An Abolitionist Handbook. And she will be in conversation with Boston's Museum of African American History, uh, Lamerchi Frazier. She's the Director of Education and Interpretation there, and she, they will be in conversation together about Patrice Culler's new book. So we hope you'll join us for this or one of our other programs. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you. And thank and, uh, you. Kristen, I just want to thank you very much and your team for all your, uh, your great help, the Boston Public Library, and thank you all folks for coming out and joining me tonight. Uh, I know we wish we were in person, but we will be next time. So thank you all very, very much. And thanks, Kristen.
Thanks, Ted. Good night, everyone. Good night.